Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll begin. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dan Byman. I'm a professor in the Security Studies program as well as the Vice Dean for the undergraduate program here in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Uh, we are delighted today to welcome Colonel Frank Subcheck, uh, who's going to talk about the study he led on the U.S. Army in the Iraq War. Uh, Colonel Subcheck uh, comes to us with uh, 26 years of uh, service in the U.S. Army, most of that in Special Forces. Um, he did peak, however, in 2002 when he got his graduate degree uh, here at Georgetown in the School of Foreign <laughs> Service. Uh, most of us consider his career having gone downhill, but nevertheless, uh, we are proud of what he's done ever since. Um, I want us to talk briefly about this study only because uh, when I've heard uh, the Colonel talk about this before, I think he's unduly modest. Uh, this study is, what, um, 1,200 uh, pages? 1,500 pages. Uh, it's a two-volume study of the U.S. experience in Iraq from 2003 to 2011 with a bit on the before and a bit on the after. Um, and it's a staggering study. It, it is, in my view, the definitive history of the US military experience in Iraq. It's um, incredibly detailed, but at the same time, incredibly well-written. So it's very accessible to those of us who have not served and for whom some of the uh, more technical side might be a little less accessible. Um, in my view, at least, it's an exceptionally critical study. Uh, many people, Many units come off looking good, I would even say heroic. Uh, some do not. Uh, if you want to talk about the implications for uh, detention policy, the implications for um, uh, uh, implications for Iran, the problems the United States had with training, uh, there's a long list of significant problems that are clear uh, from the study. Um, and you could tell, frankly, how candid it is uh, by the reception the Army gave it when it was about to be published, where there was a multi-year effort, uh, as reported in the press, to try to kill this thing. Uh, because it was a little too honest, right? And I urge you all, any of you interested in military operations or any of you interested in the U.S. experience in the Middle East, I really think it's a must read. And you should spend a lot of time uh, dedicated to this. So I'm delighted that uh, the Colonel is here with us. Um, in addition to talking about the particulars of his talk, I think he'd be more than happy to talk about any aspect of uh, the U.S. experience in Iraq, um, and uh, we'll all have a lot to learn. So please join me in thanking him uh, for joining us here at Georgetown today. I really appreciate it, and thank you very much for taking the time to attend today. Um, so, you know, before I kind of begin, I just wanted to let you know, like, the, some of the foundations for our uh, study when we uh, began it. Um, it was commissioned by the Chief Staff of the Army, General Odierno, uh, and he asked us to look at the operational level of war, kind of the level of war from the perspective of the commander in Baghdad, um, and the interactions both at the policy level, kind of, you know, back and forth with Washington, and then also translating, you know, the guidance that he had uh, received in, from the political leadership into kind of battles, campaigns, plans, and campaign strategies. And then the, the implementation of that strategy at tactical level. So everything is really centered on Baghdad. You're not asked to look at kind of the political decisions of should we have gone to war from his perspective uh, and his perspective on civil military relations. That was really not our bailiwick. That was not our you know, kind of issue to discuss. So we focused again on Baghdad and, and on the theater of command. And so much of our, you know, what we kind of concluded kind of follows from that baseline. And one of the, the things that we were really asked to do was basically figure out what went wrong. Um, he approached it from the perspective of, and he kind of gave us this as his initial kind of guidance. Uh, he said, look, uh, we, we, meaning the Army, never wrote a history of the Vietnam War. And and as such, we spent the first couple of years of the war in Iraq relearning many of the same lessons of the Vietnam War. And so he said, we cannot do that again. And that is why we have to do this study, is to kind of figure out what went wrong, what went right, and then kind of try to learn from it for the future. And so that's a lot of what my talk today will be about, is I look at what were the major operational kind of decision points, or kind of the major places at the operational level where things went wrong in Iraq. 
um, major decisions at the interaction of the policy and strategy level that had profound consequences. And so kind of as a thesis, there, there are five really main areas uh, that where problems have considerable consequences. Um, the first of these is the initial invasion plan. The second is our decisions that were made in the immediate aftermath of the uh, fall of Saddam regime. Uh, the third was the transition strategy, which lasted from 2004 up until the, the decision to surge in 2007, or end of 2006, and the execution in 2007. Uh, the fourth was the 2010 uh, parliamentary election. And then the last was the decision to go to zero, the kind of decision on what the uh, end state would look like in Iraq. So, you know, kind of I'll, I'll look at each one of those and I'll talk through kind of what what our main conclusions were. And so if you have any questions kind of about this or even about the study uh, in general or about the questions about like the drama associated with getting it published, you know, when we get to the question and answer period, please feel free, you know, completely open on whatever you'd like to discuss. Um, so in terms of the invasion period and kind of like the initial invasion planning, uh, the, the U.S. leadership, you know, principally the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, and many of his senior advisors went into the Iraq war uh, with a perspective that there would not be many troops needed to accomplish the mission. Um, and, and this was founded kind of on two bedrocks. One bedrock was the notion that a revolution in military affairs had occurred and that as such, uh, the technological advances that the United States had in terms of you know uh, laser guided bombs, global globally you know GPS guided bombs, uh, information technology that shared uh, information about where the enemy was and where our forces uh, was, made the situation so different than in previous conflicts that simply a heavy footprint of forces would not be needed. Um, and so, consequently, when all the plans were kind of put forth. Uh, the number of troops that uh, Rumsfeld and his staff and his senior leaders put together um, was always in the, on a, the very low. End. And even at one point, the Deputy Secretary of Defense had advocated that the invasion could be accomplished with a single brigade, like one brigade of about 5,000 to 7,000 troops. And in some ways, you know, we, the United States was kind of a, a, you know, a byproduct or a, a casualty of its previous successes, right? In that the, the destruction of the Iraq's military uh, and the Gulf War and operations as a shield start storm um, kind of vindicate almost that a revolution in military affairs had occurred. And that simply we could just replicate that. The operations early uh, operations in Afghanistan, operation freedom with the pairing of special operations forces with air forces, again, kind of seem to, you know, reiterate this fact that, hey, we really, things have changed in terms of, you know, security, international security, and that the United States, because of its capabilities, its technological capabilities, you know, we really just didn't need a large footprint. And so some elements of the Defense Department, I mean, it was almost a, like a quasi-religion in that they wanted to kind of, you know, as almost as, as a, you know, proselytizing prove that look, this is another example to prove that we just don't need, you know, the extensive large amount of forces. Um, prior to the uh, you know, decision to invade, there there had actually been a considerable discussion that the administration was going to decrease the size of the army from ten divisions to eight divisions. So that kind of you know formed one foundational element of it. The, the other uh, foundational element was the the assumption that the United States could do a surgical regime change within Iraq and that we could take Saddam out and he would be quickly replaced by some other leader, whether they be military, civilian, whatever. This was kind of, you know, based on the notion that, you know, the Saddam Hussein regime was, uh, and was a illegitimate regime that the Iraqi people did not support um, and that Iraq represented kind of a, a you know a unitary nation um, that had fought against Iran as a unitary nation uh, for eight years, and that the simple removing of Saddam could be accomplished relatively easily. Um, 
you know, this kind of paralleled notions of the U.S. liberating France during World War II, that there was this illegitimate occupying force kind of governing Iran, and that all we had to do was take out that leadership, replace it with a domestic legitimate leadership, and that everything would be kosher, copacetic, and, and would progress forward. And then we could just move on to the next country in the axis of evil. So those two factors really guided uh, a lot of the uh, invasion plan. Um, it created issues also on kind of like the, the command side in that when the United States set up the commands that it thought that it would have like post-invasion, um, the United States went through on the military side three different military commands within the first 13 months um, after the Saddam regime fell. It first had the coalition uh, land forces component command, um, kind of a land component of CENTCOM. Um, then it went to the Combined Joint Task Force 7, CJTF 7, uh, under Lieutenant General Sanchez. And then it went to multinational force Iraq, kind of all reflecting of uh, the challenges that after the United States actually toppled Saddam, that these premises, these assumptions, kind of proved to be unfounded. And that the number of troops that we would require um, would be actually significantly more. It was a, a real point of contention and debate. The uh, Army Chief of Staff, General Shinseki, uh, and Secretary White, the Army Secretary, um, had kind of directly contradicted the administration's kind of perspectives on the number of troops that we were required in congressional testimony, noting that, quote, several hundred thousand troops would be needed to effectively meet uh, the appropriate ratios of population to military in a counterinsurgency campaign. And so consequently, in the immediate time period after the, the fall of the regime, it became evident pretty quickly that there were not sufficient forces. Um, yet despite that, kind of again, kind of doubling down on its decisions, the administration made uh, a call to off-ramp or to not deploy the 1st Cavalry Division and to return Marine forces from uh, Iraq and to redeploy them uh, back to Conus, back to the United States. And what this, uh, the consequences of these decisions was that there was a security vacuum throughout much of Iraq, where considerable parts of the country had not only not been defeated, but had not seen any coalition forces at all. Um, there are elements of the country where, you know, Baptist, uh, leadership elements had gone into hiding and who were organizing insurgent groups, kind of a nationalist focus on insurgent groups. Um, that security vacuum also created kind of a time period wherein for the first year after the fall of Saddam regime, kind of almost like a golden hour or golden year where uh, there was considerable opportunity. And in fact, you know, it's really interesting. Many of the detainee reports from uh, Iraqi insurgents, particularly on the Sunni side, uh, during this time period, kind of mentioned, you know, that the they were actually happy with the defeat of Saddam and the removal of Saddam, and that they mentioned, you know, like the United States, uh, you know, as a country that you know put a uh, man on the moon, you have anything within your power, and yet, you know, for the year after the fall of Saddam, there was chaos. There was Fauda, there was absolute, you know, mess where no one was governing, where from their perspective, again, from the Sunni's perspective, that they uh, that the United States was allowing kind of in consp uh, conspiratorial kind of overtones, um, the Persians or Iran to kind of come in and take over. Um, and that as a result of that kind of time period and that, you know, blown opportunity, that they joined the insurgency and then started fighting against the United States. Um, so the combination of both uh, the inability to actually create a secure environment, as well as the, the failed kind of ability to meet expectations in that time period were byproducts of not having sufficient forces. Um, a second element is, uh, was that uh, the United States, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the fall done, made a series of uh, catastrophic decisions. Um, some of these are very well known. You know, the CP or CPA orders one and two, uh, debacification and the disbanding of the Iraqi army, 
kind of in you know, two foul swoops, um, put uh, a significant uh, population um, out of work, unable to provide for their families, um, who had military training, had organization, and now had a motive to fight against us. Um, furthermore, the devification, the, it was seen by many Sunnis kind of, again, furthering this, uh, this notion that we were handing over Iraq to Persia or to Iran, again, from their perspective. So it kind of reinforced their uh, kind of sectarian tendencies, you know, to kind of, it was almost divisional within the country. Uh, so though, you know, the, the decisions cut very deeply, <laughs> Um, no element of society was spared. 40,000 uh, you know, elementary school uh, teachers were put out of work by the devaluation order. Because you know, much like kind of communist uh, system, if you weren't a Ba'ath Party member, you simply could not hold a job. It was like your union power. And so our decisions in that time period to you know, implement them really created, you know, enemies within 20% of the population and gave them reasons to kind of to fight us and then also reinforced the sectarian narratives which they kind of feared were, were, were occurring. At the same time, the U.S. made a decision, you know, kind of in the November 2003 time period to accelerate uh, the elections and to accelerate the transfer of sovereignty. Originally, the transfer of sovereignty back to Iraq had uh, planned to occur in kind of like the 2006, 2007, or even 2008 time period. Um, but as things kind of weren't going well, um, and we actually had several military and civilian people, civilian uh, leaders tell us that they felt that the decision to transfer so sovereignty early um, which again was made right in the immediate aftermath of the fall of Saddam uh, regime, was in effect kind of trying to paint a positive spin on the situation in Iraq prior to the 2004 elections. Kind of try to be able to say, give a win and say politically that look, you know, things are improving, we're actually transferring sovereignty uh, in June, and you know, Iraq's gonna be its own nation. Um, the challenge with the tra transferring sovereignty was that not only did it accelerate uh, elections, but it also made it much more difficult for the United States to be able to agencies kind of in competition with each other to kind of prevent you know, a coup from happening, um, a very dysfunctional kind of system, um, um, as well as it uh, prevented the United States from being able to kind of you know, hire or fire uh, Iraqi leaders within the army, the police, and other national security elements as that became kind of part of the U.S. strategy to uh, transition power to the Iraqis, um, it, it, as you know, it, it made it much more difficult for us to kind of intercede in areas where either corruption, sectarianism, or other problems were occurring, because Iraq would kind of fall back on the issue of, hey, we're a sovereign country, you know, we, you know, you don't have the ability to kind of pull the strings anymore, and in many cases, the United States really you know, at the tactical level, at the implementation level, you know, saw it through that lens that, hey, we're going to, you know, give the Iraqis a chance. This is, uh, you know, a sovereign nation. And so in terms of picking Iraqi military leaders, that's not really our role to play. That is an Iraqi responsibility. And they have to learn how to do it. Um, so that created considerable challenges later on as kind of the, a sectarian civil war began to kind of like um, during this phase, the decision to, to uh, transfer sovereignty also early also um, had a second order effect in that it would require elections to happen much earlier than they had originally been anticipated. Um, and so there was a decision made that there would be a, an election in December 2004 that would put into place an interim government that would write a constitution. Um, then that constitution would be voted upon uh, in uh, October 2005, and then there would be a final actual uh, Iraqi parliamentary election in December 2005 that would create a four-year government. And so the, the second and third order effects, again, of having these early elections 
was that as a kind of a civil war was kind of brewing, it kind of threw you know, gasoline on those sectarian fires in that it created a means for competition, kind of a political means for competition in addition to a military means for competition. And the, the, the way that they were conducted um, were, was problematic also. In that the first election, many of the Sunnis decided to sit out. They uh, did not vote in the, in the election. Uh, and consequently, uh, for the group that was chosen to write the constitution, there are only about 2% of the electorate, kind of underrepresented almost by a factor of 10. Um, thus, when the constitution was written, it was written by individuals who were not interested in supporting kind of Sunni interests. And as a result, the constitution, when it was voted upon, Sunnis by and large uh, went out actually and did vote that time, um, but they voted against the Constitution almost unanimously. Um, so again, these, these electoral events became further avenues for competition rather than unifying elements, um, which was kind of a challenge within US military doctrine in that, you know, whether it be the Marine Corps Small Wars Manual or the you know, US uh, <coughs> Army's perspective on low intensity conflict and counterinsurgency conflict, there was a perception that uh, elections would be stabilizing elements um, and that you have elections you create a legitimate government and then that legitimate government seems you know would tamp out or provide you know you know let the air out of the balloon of the insurgency because then the insurgency is kind of you know complaint that hey it's an illegitimate government would be you know would be deflated the challenge was is that the way that the, the elections were conducted it effectively enabled that large elements of the population saw the elections as illegitimate. Um, and so consequently, it exacerbated ethno-sectarian tensions. Now, at the next phase, uh, the United States pursued a strategy called the transition strategy. Um, and this was kind of during those, while the elections were occurring, uh, from 2004 up until like the end of 2006, the principal U.S. strategy um, was a strategy focused on transitioning uh, security responsibilities and political responsibilities to the sovereign Iraqi government as quickly as possible. And so on the military side, this was kind of, you know, founded on two basic premises. Um, one was the notion of dependency in that we need to transition responsibility as quickly as possible. Uh, because if we don't transition responsibility, the U.S. military, particularly like the Army, its soldiers and the Marines, you know, they're like they're the energizer bunny. You know, they're the ones that are, are going to accomplish the mission no matter what. They're going to work hard. They're going to put their shoulders to the wheel. And if the Iraqis don't do it, well, then our military is going to do it. So if, therefore, the transition strategy saw that if we had a large footprint, we're going to end up doing it for the Iraqis. The US military is going to step in and you know, kind of thereby actually lengthen the amount of time that the US would be there. So consequently, the strategy held that if we have a smaller footprint, um, the Iraqis, it will serve as a forcing function to force the Iraqis to do it themselves. This is kind of the analogy that Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld used on you know, riding a bicycle, that well, when you're teaching someone to ride a bicycle, you hold the bicycle kind of before, you know, uh, behind them for a while as they're learning. Then you, you go from, you know, one hand or two hands to a couple fingers to one finger and then to finally they're on their own. Um, so dependency was a, kind of a, a component of the, the thought process to why they wanted to go that way. The other element uh, of why they thought this was a, a viable strategy um, was the, uh, the notion that the kind of the antibody theory in that no matter how benign or how positive US forces tried to be within Iraq, they were an outside uh, you know, element and almost like an invading force, they would create like a virus. They would create antibodies that would come fight them. And no amount of SERP, no amount of civil affairs projects, no amount of goodwill would kind of be able to overcome this. Um, kind of a combination of um, Iraq's colonial uh, legacy 
um, and it's you know, passed, and uh, that US forces would be seen as invaders. Um, and that that, in conjunction with the fact of any time you put civilians and military uh, together in close proximity, fighting a counterinsurgency, you are likely to have civilian casualties. And those civilian casualties um, will kind of, in the kind of Kill Collins notion of the accidental guerrilla, will create more insurgents. So thereby, the, the other element of this transition strategy held that we should again minimize our footprint within Iraq um, in order to prevent that. The fewer interactions that U.S. soldiers have with Iraqi civilians, um, the better. <coughs> because again, that's fewer opportunities to cause civilian casualties, fewer opportunities to kind of have these negative interactions. And so, so therefore, again, the, the core elements of the strategy were to withdraw as quickly as possible. Um, and as can, you know, in consequence, the U.S. military during this period actually created what was known as Iraqi BRAC, like an Iraqi base realignment and closure system um, where, you know, again, as a premise to this, the U.S. would be, we would both decrease the number of troops in Iraq and we would consolidate them on larger and larger bases. And so in 2004, uh, we closed something like 36 bases uh, in 2000, correction, that was 2005. 2005, we closed 36 bases. 2006, uh, we went from 110 to 56 principal bases with the overall plan that eventually the United States would get to three uh, bases and then theoretically withdraw at some point. Um, now, the you know, kind of consequences of this transition strategy, you know, which again, the US would make an effort to try to train the Iraqi security forces um, with the uh, mobile transition teams to try to pass responsibility to them, which is kind of like an issue in itself of the inability of the US Army and Marine Corps to be able to kind of build partner capacity to do security force assistance well with the Iraqis. Certainly the US military was really not well equipped at that time period and probably not really well equipped now still um, to, to do that. Um, yet we're still gonna continue to push our responsibility to the Iraqis. Now the challenge was that our, one of the main problems was uh, during that time period, kind of the first couple years of the war, several things had happened. Um, and that on one end, the insurgency had transitioned from kind of a nationalist insurgency, kind of a unified nationalist, principally Sunni insurgency, uh, to uh, a uh, violent extremist Al-Qaeda sponsored uh, organization uh, under Abu Musab Zarqawi. Um, Zarqawi's core, his campaign strategy, okay, was to ignite a sectarian civil war in Iraq so that, you know, even though the Sunnis represented 20% of the population, that there would be a civil war in Iraq and that the other Sunnis throughout the rest of the Middle East would have to come to the Sunnis' aid in Iraq and thereby, you know, eventually win this civil war. Um, so on the insurgency side, there's kind of a, there's a civil, you know, he's trying to incite a civil war. On external actors, uh, Syria is supporting this effort by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, interestingly enough, even though they're Alawite, Shia. Um, but again, you know, kind of the old adage of the enemy, my enemy is my friend, and hey, <coughs> by the way, I was on the short list of, you know, the axis of evil or the extended axis of evil, technically, which Bolton said at the UN. Um, and they're like, hey, we don't want to be next. Um, on the, uh, on the uh, eastern border, uh, Iran, is supporting uh, Shia militias. And many of those militias are kind of directly fighting against uh, the efforts that Zarqawi and uh, his group are trying to do to inflame civil war. And they're attacking Sunni targets, they're assassinating leaders, they uh, begin a serious kind of ethnic cleansing within Baghdad. Um, and so both external elements and internal elements are also kind of contributing to tr almost, you know, creating a civil war where the internal competition has transitioned from a simple nationalistic insurgency to almost a full-blown civil war. And this is the same point that the United States is beginning really to step back so, and, and minimize its presence. 
So at that point, the U.S. transition strategy effectively blinds us to what is going on. And we both lose uh, situational awareness and uh, we create a security vacuum where because our forces have decreased in number, the number of brigades in Iraq has dropped uh, from uh, 15 to 12 um, with a notion that it's going to go down to 10 uh, by the end of 2006. That kind of gets arrested as the Bush administration steps in and says, hey, you know, things are not really going that well. Um, but the, the decision to kind of pursue the transition strategy both creates more venues for competition in terms of the elections, create a, a political competition, inflames tensions where rather than give an opportunity to kind of uh, depoliticize and, and also try to reach, you know, rapprochement and, and try to get reconciliation amongst the different groups. Um, the political acceleration inflames that. The military acceleration both blinds us in terms of situational awareness and creates a security vacuum. And so by the end of 2006, uh, the Shia-dominated government has become a com combatant in the de facto civil war. Uh, ministries have been taken over by Iranian-supported militias, uh, and they're running death squads against uh, their fellow Iraqis. Uh, elements of the national police are uh, killing or setting up roadblocks, killing uh, Sunni civilians. Uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, elements of it has been taken over by also, again, Iranian supported uh, militias, and they're euthanizing uh, Sunni civilians who come into hospitals. Um, so the, the situation has become dire. And by mid 2006, the Bush administration uh, realizes this and kind of comes to uh, an awakening. Uh, and decides to change strategy. Um, and after a period of kind of deliberations, uh, the President Bush decides that he's gonna pursue a strategy known as the surge strategy. And that from 12 brigades, they're going to go up to 20 brigades within Iraq. Um, they'll add five brigades, uh, plus uh, three additional brigades will be added. There'll also be two uh, Marine regiments will also be deployed. Um, so there's a considerable, they effectively, he effectively reverses the transition strategy and says, this tr strategy was a failure. We are going to, you know, double down and we're going to go in completely the opposite direction. So not only does the number of forces, you know, increase dramatically, but the decision to consolidate on bases is reversed. And during 2007, the, um, the number of bases goes up to 495 bases. I'm kind of reflecting counterinsurgency doctrine that in order to be effective, you actually have to live with the population. You have to be out, uh, not on large bases where you have Starbucks and Burger King and all the creature comforts of the world, but you live with the population. Um, and so that element of counterinsurgency strategy um, becomes engaged there, uh, it changes. Um, at the same time, uh, the organic uh, sakwa or the Sunni awakening uh, really has taken off um, and the political and military leaders uh, in Baghdad make a decision that they're going to support, that they're going to throw their weight behind it, that even though that there are elements within the Sunni awakening who are former insurgents who had fought the United States previously and who have literally from the perspective of American troops blood on their hands, um, that they're going to support it financially and provide weapons in some cases to arm these Sunni groups to fight against other insurgents and elements of the civil war. Um, this, in many ways, helps take out one uh, or and a key element of the opposition in that the Sunni nationalists who previously had had kind of a uh, support of the violent extremist organizations in Iraq um, because they felt that they really didn't have a choice um, and that with the Shia sponsored uh, or Shia government, Iranian uh, sponsored death squads, you know, hunting them uh, and their relatives in Baghdad and its environs, um, that they didn't have any other option other than to work with Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, but 
with them deciding that, hey, the United States is willing to support us um, and that we can fight in Iraq, um, that changes the dynamic considerably on the Sunni side. Um, so the combination of more forces, following a counterinsurgency strategy, expanding the footprint, the uh, commitment to support the Sahwa, um, and then also considerable effort politically to try to um, reconcile the different groups, effectively tamps down violence in Iraq. And by the end of 2008, uh, the Civil War, um, it's been reduced to embers. Um, and there are days uh, in Baghdad where there are no security incidents. And there are months that transpire where the number of Americans uh, killed in Iraq um, by accident exceeds the number of Americans killed in Iraq in combat. Um, and this occurs for month after month after month. And so the security situation has massively changed, but it's very precarious. Um, and uh, you know, it is at that point um, where the United States, um, again, kind of in the United States having committed itself to a uh, non-existential conflict, um, it, effectively the clock on support um, within both the Washington, within the American population, and with support in Baghdad has run out. And so support for kind of an extended operation has evaporated. Uh, the Obama administration is elected in uh, 2008, and consequently, they pursue their uh, party platform, um, which was to withdraw from Iraq. Um, and uh, the, in, in 2010, uh, and the decision to kind of uh, draw down uh, begins. Uh, in 2010, uh, the, uh, there is the uh, parliamentary election that occurs um, in Iraq. And this is another major kind of turning point um, in that uh, Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki is up for a re-election. Um, and uh, he has had a series kind of of both uh, from the American perspective, or the American uniform military perspective, um, a series of kind of worrisome, um, both sectarian um, and uh, authoritarian tendencies. Um, and during the 2010 election, uh, he loses the election by a small amount. And so technically, uh, his opponent, Yad Alawi, um, was, should have been authorized the opportunity to try to form a coalition government first. Um, however, um, a combination of factors kind of occurs, and Maliki kind of manipulates the system um, to enable him to uh, use kind of like our own CPA orders of devaccination to uh, invalidate uh, some of the Sunni candidates um, who had been won seats as a result of the electoral process. Um, he puts pressure on the um, Iraqi Electoral Commission, um, actually threatens them at several occasions, threatens to surround them uh, with tanks, you know, puts pressure on them to allow him to be able to, to uh, form a coalition first. And then he uh, uses kind of influences uh, the Chief Justice uh, Mahmoud, Mahmoud uh, to kind of rule in his favor. Um, so kind of a whole series of events he uses to try to manipulate to allow him to form a government first. At the same time, the U.S. kind of uh, policy reflects that Iraq is a sovereign nation. Um, this is really something that we shouldn't get involved with. Um, the you know, reality in Iraq um, is that it's 60%-ish of the population is Shia, um, so that Iraq, you know, from the administration's perspective, um, you know, quote unquote, Iraq should be governed by a Shia uh, leader. Um, and that, you know, Maliki is, quote unquote, you know, the devil we know, um, and we'd be more comfortable uh, with him in power than anyone else. Um, at the same time, interestingly, uh, as a note, the um, Yad Alawi is a, a secular Sunni. Um, he has kind of connections with the, the U.S. 
Um, there are Sunni uh, members within kind of his, you know, uh, constellation of uh, support. Uh, and uh, he, um, he's, he's got support um, through different groups uh, to, to help him out. Um, so his uh, position, even though he's a sexual Shia, he was supportive of kind of moving forward. And he was not, he had Sunnis within his constellation and he did not, uh, he wanted to kind of like try to rebuild Iraq. The administration, however, kind of sees him possibly as uh, a danger in that it would, the, the words they use in their internal deliberations is that it would potentially be like putting an Afrikaner in charge of South Africa after its uh, independence. Um, so consequently, they don't put any support behind him. They continue to put support behind Maliki, um, even though the military leadership in Iraq is sending very worrisome signals back to the uh, administration that um, Maliki is, quote, uh, and this is an official table, um, you know, implementing a rolling coup, unquote, um, within Iraq, and that, you know, if he is, in effect, uh, selected to be the prime minister, it has the possibility of reigniting civil war, um, was, were notes that were sent back. Um, at the same time, Iran, Mm -hmm. um, is actually fully supportive of uh, uh, Maliki. And so they actually call uh, many of the um, Iraqi political class uh, to Tehran um, and meet with uh, IRGC Quds Force leaders um, who kind of, you know, not so diplomatically remind them that after the United States leaves, we will still be here, um, and you should probably remember that. Uh, and so, uh, as a result of uh, Maliki, after a long series, uh, a long series of, uh, of months where there is no government form, he is allowed to form the first, uh, had the opportunity to form the first government, and he becomes prime minister uh, again. Um, and then this uh, has huge consequences, um, both during the decision to try to what will happen. Um, during the, uh, you know, the decision to withdraw, as well as the period immediately after that, um, because Maliki's authoritarian and sectarian tendencies kind of play out. Um, the next kind of, you know, the final area where there's uh, you know, a, a operational level decision that has huge consequences um, was on the, the go to zero decision, kind of the decision on what the residual force in Iraq would look um, and as um, they're kind of going toward the, the December 2011, when all U.S. combat forces are supposed to leave Iraq, um, there's the debate within the administration on exactly what the residual footprint should look, look like and what they should propose to the Iraqis. Um, and on the military side, uh, the recommendations range anywhere from uh, 24,000 uh, to divisions. Um, which was the theater commander's uh, recommendation to a division, uh, which was the uh, central command commander's decision, uh, correction recommendation. And then eventually, as the administration kind of is obviously is not comfortable um, with that, there's kind of a civil military discussion, uh, kind of a dialogue uh, that occurs. Um, and the administration first proposes, well, possibly we'll go with 5,000. Well, no, we think maybe 2,000 would be the, the best number that we, we think we could go with. Um, when those numbers, oh, and the administration also decides that um, not only do we want to go with 2,000, perhaps as our kind of uh, residual force number, um, but uh, we're also going to propose to the Iraqis or note to the Iraqis that it will require a parliamentary approval um, on a new status of force agreements to allow U.S. troops to stay. Um, those two factors effectively become kind of equivalent of poison pills that kill the uh, option on the Iraqi side. First, the when 2000, uh, the number 2000 is kind of proposed to the Iraqis, they're kind of in shock, uh, and they look at it from the perspective of, well, you know, you know, if we're going to expend considerable political capital to keep Americans here who had made you know, portions of the domestic political 
uh, you know, environment see them as occupiers, uh, we're not going to get a lot of bang for that buck if you only have 2,000 troops here, because that's really not a lot to kind of help you know, our security, help transition us forward. So why would we want to expend the political capital in exchange for that? Second um, is the notion that, uh, that it would require parliamentary approval. It's dead on the rival. And politically, it is seen as it's just not going to happen. And so a debate kind of, again, occurs within the administration, kind of different perspectives on you know, what, uh, whether we should revise our offer um, with, uh, the president, uh, with the vice president, uh, Vice President Biden, who's kind of uh, the point person uh, within the administration um, for Iraq, um, the and the national security advisor, um, both kind of holding uh, uh, to the position Hey, we've offered what we should offer. If we go to zero, that's fine. You know, our entire, we believe that, you know, we should withdraw from Iraq. The uh, others within the administration uh, disagree. And so the Secretary of Defense, the CIA director, the Secretary of State, um, the Chairman of Joint Chiefs, um, and Central Command Commander all recommend retaining some sort of residual force. Um, that does not happen. Uh, the decision is made, the president uh, makes the decision, and the residual force goes to zero. And it's interesting that in the, when the you know, United States is actually on the day that the United States is leaving, and if you've ever seen kind of like a uh, deactivation ceremony, it's a very kind of solemn military affair where they actually, military units have flags, you know, kind of harkening back to Civil War and you know, Revolutionary War. And those flags are actually furled. They're kind of cased and then brought off to a historical uh, location where they're kept. And you know, for that ceremony, uh, Prime Minister Maliki was, you know, had, was given a seat. Um, but during the ceremony, his seat is empty um, because he is busy elsewhere. And he is busy in that on the actual day of uh, the deactivation, um, he is in the process of impeaching uh, his uh, Sunni uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, of trying to arrest the Sunni Vice President and arresting the D governor of Diyala province, who's also a Sunni, uh, and then arresting the uh, director of the Iraqi Electoral Commission, who had previously you know, pushed him against him in, uh, in the 2010 election. Um, he then, in, in, over the next you know, span of the next two years, uh, he continues this very uh, sectarian kind of, uh, you know, fight against the Sunnis, uh, arresting other leaders. Um, his elite force, the Iraqi Special Operations Forces, um, has, you know, earned kind of the moniker of uh, Fedayeen Maliki, um, which previously the Fedayeen Saddam had been like the Saddam's kind of you know, thugs who would kind of go in and arrest uh, people who disagree with them. So Maliki's, Elmans Maliki's military had become known as you know, Fedayeen and Maliki, um, kind of reflecting this, this change. Uh, he politicizes the military and within the span of two years, removes every uh, division commander and above and replaces them with sycophants and sectarian supporters. Um, almost all Shia, uh, and basically transforms the military from an organization that would that had been semi-functional, um, and that effectively anyone who was seen as working too closely with the Americans was pulled out, um, despite the fact even if they had been effective or not. Um, he would, and replaced them with people that he considered as people who uh, were his trusted confidants. Um, at the the kind of the final straw uh, occurs in uh, 2012 uh, when uh, the finance minister Rafi Sawi, who is kind of known like universally as the, a technocrat, a uh, kind of a, a person who is absolutely committed to Iraq's future, uh, making it a better country, uh, is you know, the arrest warrant for, for him is uh, also put out. Uh, there's kind of a Sunni uprisings, which begin as protests, um, but as Maliki brings forces in uh, to kind of tamp down these protests, violence ensues, um, and then the kind of civil war that um, had been tamped down into uh, embers kind of has reignited. 
Um, that uh, reignition is taken advantage of by Daesh, by ISIS, um, and then the civil war really returns in, in, in earnest with eventually uh, Daesh uh, mar marching down to the environs of Baghdad. Um, so, you know, with that, to me, those, and that's what from our study, those were really the five top most crucial operational level decisions on why things transpired in Iraq. Now, there are many other reasons and other things that we could talk about, but those were the, the key ones. The one thing I would, uh, you know, kind of like to throw out before I transition to questions is that, you know, this is definitely not, uh, you know, we, we definitely did not have the perspective that, um, as some have tried to paint us, that, hey, everything was won, the surge was won, and the war was won by the surge. That is not the case. Um, the situation, it, uh, the surge had improved the situation considerably, um, but the war was far from won, and it is even very debatable if the war could have even been won, and I'm putting won in like quotation marks here, um, kind of like hate that term, but whatever. Um, just because so much time had transpired, um, and so many, you know, bad decisions had been made, by the time of the surge that, you know, in many areas it's questionable on whether it was recoverable. Um, but I guess with that, I will close um, and open the floor for questions. Uh, be, before we open it up, I just have uh, one question to, to jump in with. Um, on, the, on the surge and the, there's of course the troop surge and then there's the decision to back the South Lot. Um, could that have been done two years before, or did it require changes within the Sunni community world in order to enable the opportunity that was successfully seized upon? Yeah, so I think, uh, is it, the question, is it just the Sahwa or the whole, the decision to surge also? Um, uh, just the Sahwa. I mean, okay. assuming so, uh, yeah, President yeah. Bush had decided, so or, the, or, or the operational leadership had decided. Forces more. Exactly. Okay, so they're really interesting. The, what we found was that um, in 2004 and 2005, that various tribal elements had actually made outreach to the United States to try to initiate what would later become the Sahwa. Um, and that in 04, uh, they were turned down for a couple of reasons. Um, one was this perception that, hey, we created this new Iraq and it's a democracy and tribalism isn't a part of democracy. You know, you should have your loyalty to the Iraqi state and to an electoral process, and arming tribal militias really is not a part of that strategy, that we are creating an Iraqi national military. Um, so in 04, yeah, it, it crashed and burned, um, and it didn't even get off the ground. In 05, um, there, there was some, it went so far as some groups were armed uh, and supported, but, it was very much at the tactical level and kind of like the bottom level where the Siege of Soto, the Army Green Berets, had kind of collaborated um, with the Marines in a couple of like test beds to, to arm these tribal militias. And they were effective, um, but they were also the, the central leadership in Baghdad really, it, it was not, it was not in opposition, but it was not in support. It did not offer weapons and money, and I mean, you know, we basically paid. Um, so, so the answer to your question is, yeah, it, it, I, I think it could have been started earlier. Um, certainly, you know, by oh, you know, oh six, oh seven, things were ripe too. Okay. okay, I think I'll let you make your own questions. Okay, okay. questions. Um, uh, what do you think the implications of the lessons learned are for Afghanistan and other conflicts that we're still in that are? Yeah, protracted. Yeah, so first of all is that uh, to try to do you know, nation building and or building a military in a society that is very heterogeneous is very difficult. And it takes a long, long time. And that every effort should be made to try to like prevent inflaming sectarian tendencies. And that you know, while I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard, like, because there's a balance. 
um, in that the sooner that you, you know, provide sovereignty and the sooner you, you, you establish, you know, domestic leadership, um, you know, you have, obviously there's a international political pressure to do that. There's domestic political pressure to do that. But at the same time, sometimes particularly kind of in, in societies that have been ravaged and like, whether destroyed by sanctions or war or whatever, that I think we should try to refrain, refrain from that instinct in order to try to give time for reconciliation and to help guide that reconciliation as much as possible, as well as to build kind of like civil society, to build uh, transparency, to build institutions that aren't corrupt, it, it was kind of like th there was a debate that actually occurred kind of within the administration on like how to do it. And one side said, hey, take it slow. We'll build from the bottom up. You build like the city and the council level. And then once you've built that, then you, you build the next level, kind of like the regionals, the districts, whatever. And then eventually you get to the national level. The other uh, element said, hey, no, you cannot do that. You have to start the national level and then the roots will grow down. Um, I would argue that, you know, the, the, the second case, which was the case that won out was not successful and that, that while I don't know for sure that the first one would have been, I think it would have had that more chance of success. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, other questions? Uh, so, um, we were reading about the Iraq war in our national security policy last week, mm -hmm. okay? um, and particularly George Packard's book, uh, um, yeah, I'm right. Curious about your take on the argument that like the ORHA, right? The your ORHA. Mm -hmm. right after the invasion. Yeah. Um, their recommendations hadn't been fully like listen to authentic police force and very out of the uh force for reconstruction. Yeah. Do you think that like if those recommendations had been immediately instituted, the the chances of there being this sectarian conflict would have been drastically minimized or like not to ask you kind of factual yeah, yeah, it's definitely counterfactual, but I, I think, you know, one of the key components, you know, again, like in this, in this whole like immediate aftermath and then also the decisions on kind of like how we were going to uh, kind of govern Iraq, we really we had a horrible plan. Um, and on the civilian side, you know, we went from Orha, uh, Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance um, by Jay Garner, uh, which was like 40, 50 people like to show you the extent of the lack of planning kind of that had been like put toward this on like how we're going to govern things afterwards which is in stark contrast to like how we approach the problem set of post-war governance in germany and japan like, like diametrically opposite um you know we went from that to the cpa to an embassy also in 13 months so three different organizations 13 months, two of them massively underfunded. It's, a, it's more than a lost year because you really don't get a, an embassy even set up for about 18 months. Um, so I think the combination of all of that turbulence on trying to settle on a policy and create a policy, coupled with the fact that we really had not resourced uh, post-war governance, I think that greatly contributed to the failure. Um, you know, would it have increased our chances for success? I believe so, certainly. I think if we'd approached it kind of like Germany or Japan, you know, like post-war reconstruction governance, I think we had a, a greater chance of success. I'm not sure how, mu what, how much that, you know, it, it moves the needle. Okay. So just <clears throat> building off of that, um, because you just spoke to Germany and Japan, you also said in the previous answer that it's very difficult to do uh, reconstruction in a heterogeneous state. Yeah. Um, do you feel that that heterogeneity mm -hmm. was, um, yeah, that's right. was, uh, um, was a larger factor than perhaps the resources when comparing um, reconstruction in Iraq to the post-war German and uh, Japanese reconstruction sort of contributed to that? Was it more the lack of resources and the lack of planning? Was it more that we're dealing with a heterogeneous rather than a homogeneous society folk? I mean, certainly from my perspective, it's, it's some of both. Um, and, and really, you know, 
we did not we have all, we, we the amount of resources we dedicated to it toward governance and reconstruction in in for the first year and a half two you know two years is just it, it really was there was this notion that and, and what drove it was this notion that <clears throat> well we're going to take out Saddam we're going to somebody else is either going to step in or we're going to put someone else in and then everything's going to work and like all the governance elements are just going to kind of like progress like they did. And, and I mean, and that's why I was under resourced. So I think under resourcing was a major factor, but at the same time, you know, the you know, fact that Germany and Japan are much more homogeneous states, nation states than, than Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. also plays a huge factor. Um, I know I'm not completely answering your question. I, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, resourcing matters also. Um, and we certainly really under-resourced, like, for the beginning. Like, there really was this notion that, hey, you know, we're going to topple him. Somebody else is going to step in. Um, as well as, you know, I mean, and this is the era, you know, the Rumsfeld era where right before the, even the uniformed military is, you know, these unnamed sources of general officers are, are you know, talking to the, the Post or the Times and saying, I wish I could hang a banner on the Pentagon that said, we don't do peacekeeping. And so there's a real resistance within the military as well that well, this is, we, we do wars, we kill people, you know, we like destroy things, we destroy other nation states, that's what we do. Um, and that, you know, we don't get involved in this messy stuff. Um, so a little bit of both. <clears throat> I want to ask your opinion about the current protests going on in Iraq and uh, sort of the potential for um, sectarianism, civil war, and for the resurgence. Like, yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 you know, I'll say I think it definitely the potential is there. Um, I. Yeah, in one you know, on one hand, I think many of the Iraqi people are you know, so tired and exhausted of war, and Iran has overplayed their hands certainly, um, and there always has been you know a large element of you know the whether it be insurgency, opposition, whatever, that has had a nationalist kind of you know component. I mean, you know, Muqtada al-Sadr, you know, almost always. Has I mean there were a couple eras where, you know, kind of faced with near extinction, but he kind of took some assistance from Iran. But in, in most cases, he's been very he's really a nationalist and and doesn't want the U.S. or Iran or anyone else really meddling within Iraq. And kind of consequently, you know, I mean, do I think that there's a possibility of civil war? I, I do think it's possible that it could be ignited. Um, I don't, you know, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a pretty bad situation. Um, um, so kind of on, uh, that's an interesting segue to my question. So with regards to like Shia militias, comparing like the Saba among Sunni tribes yeah. to like how um, the U.S. policy was towards Shia militias, I mean, uh, the interesting thing is, you know, compared to like, um, you know, Al-Qaeda and other Sunni groups, I mean, sometimes there's kind of an, uh, de facto, you know, understanding between Shia militias and the U.S. or, you know, at times, you know, you stayed out of each other's way and whatnot. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, and, you know, especially even given the fact that, like, the Sadr is very vocally anti-U.S., but with that kind of understanding going on, do you think that there was some kind of role to be played that the U.S. could have engaged with, with Shia militias more? Positively. Mm -hmm. We saw the, the Shia um, militias as very monolithic. Um, and th there were anything but, um, you know, particularly post 04, um, when kind of a splintering, uh, of jam occurs, um, I think there really were some opportunities there to, you know, you know, even in the groups that would not ally with us, but just the, 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 we failed to recognize that even if they disagreed with us, perhaps that 
they would be, rather than fighting them directly, they could be a good component of the government to serve as a, a buffer to Iranian expansionism. I, I think that is a, definitely a missed opportunity. Um, well, to follow, to follow up on that, then, one, th one thing I'm noticing is that we tend to assume that whatever enemy we were facing at a given time was the Mongolian government. Yeah. We assume that, we assume that <clears throat> the Iraqi government initially would had sort of modular parts that could be swapped out. Mm -hmm. We assume that the Shia militias were a single unit. So what? I mean, granted, a lot of our previous warfighting experience has been with unitary opponents. But yeah, unitary nation states. Yeah. Yeah. So is that why we assume that these are moments or? So, I mean, I think there are a lot, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. Um, I think some of it is that within a defense establishment, there is certainly a predilection to kind of like fighting unitary nation states. Um, I think that's kind of like the favored way of doing business. I think, um, frankly, as Americans, it's like part of our identity. Like we, we do tend to, we have more issues with complexity than uh, some other cultures. And that, and, and sometimes we we do see things as you know white and black, and we, we have we have difficulty seeing the nuance. I I think also some of it was particularly just individuals within the administration um, that their own personal like how they saw the world, their worldview was again similar to that. Um, so I think all those kind of play factors and why. Why, why it was tough and, and why we made some of those mistakes we did. And, and I mean, you know, some of it also, you know, frankly was, uh, you know, it's not to undersell or, or, or to present, you know, some of the people as, who made these decisions as dumb or bad, but, but also that in some way, some of the institutions also failed them. You know, uh, the, the internal intelligence um, on what was going on within Iraq, um, didn't do a very good job on laying like the human terrain and explaining that. Um, it, it are, I would argue that we have, and I mean, again, this is part of the American culture. We're so technologically based um, that we, we rely on signals intelligence rather than more on human intelligence and an understanding like the human footprint and, and human kind of geography. Um, and, and that made it more difficult to inform some of the decision makers effectively. Okay. Uh, so you, you finish this report, you publish it, and it, there's difficulty in publishing it, which I guess oh, nobody oh yeah. has mentioned yet. And <laughs> one of my questions, and particularly people involved in defense and security, is what do you believe that the resistance to that says about the military as an organization, but one that doesn't seem very willing to kind of confront with its past mm -hmm. or kind of admit to failure, particularly when militaries and personnel in the military are trained to think we are never wrong, we're always right, we've got the, the, inter the interest of the nation at heart, so therefore being critical of us is kind of not the way to go. So yeah. is that a problem, particularly as you go forward now, where well, policymakers run into similar issues where I can't trust the military to ever think of things with any nuance because they just got to drive ahead. Yeah. So it's weird. I mean, some of it is really is personality based and who the people are who are making decisions at different time periods. Um, like when when the project was originally commissioned, you know, General Odierno, he was beyond supportive, and he basically gave us the keys to the kingdom. Uh, we went down to US, you know, to CENTCOM, US Central Command, and they're like, hey, you know, the SIPR, the secure archive, the secure databases, look through it, declassify whatever you want. Um, you know, I mean, we, we you know, access special access programs that we reviewed. Um, and that, it, you know, as we went through the process to make sure there's actually a defense officer pre-publication security review that reviews everything to make sure that you don't reveal anything that's classified or that it hasn't been declassified. Um, but, you know, and, and he was very supportive 
of trying to learn from it. Uh, when General Milley took over, who is now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, that evaporated like instantaneously. And, and, so, and I mean, it, it reflects in elements. I mean, there are elements, certainly, I think, within the military that that are reluctant to crit the criticism and that want to kind of just avoid bad press, that don't want to deal with anything that could be seen as being controversial. And I mean, so, you know, when, and again, this is again, very different in personalities. When Oyerno sat down, like he, he gave us explicit guidance and some things that are really, I mean, you know, he told us, quote, if you have to kill some sacred cows, kill some sacred cows. I would rather accept, uh, I, I, I'm willing to accept risk on controversy so that we can learn from it. Um, and he told us, like, some things that were really, like, like, these are within the military, like, like we don't touch them. Um, he's like, I want to talk about the National Guard. Uh, I want to talk about our allies. Uh, I want to talk about the Marine Corps role. Uh, I want to have a mature but professional discussion about civil military relations embodied within this. All those are like, each, any one of those is like the equivalent of the abortion or gun control debate within the military. Um, that like, you know, on the official side, you, know, you just don't talk about it. Like they're, you know, you know, crazy uncle or whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, when, you know, when Millie came in, man, it was like, <laughs> you were going to talk about that? You know, like, what? Like, who authorized this? Why did they do it? Um, so that was an, an element of it, that, that just like any of those controversial topics is like, hey, yeah, we don't talk about this. Stuff. Was that kind of a shock considering he came from a special operations background to you? It has to be. I, I, well, I work with conventional forces long enough to know how they work. <laughs> Um, and so there's a real, I mean, the, the, there's a huge variance in like risk, like between special operations and the conventional army. Um, and it's, it's changed. And I mean, look, we in special operations, we have our own flaws. And I could like, I could talk for hours about that. Um, so we're not perfect either. But in one area, we're much more willing to accept risk than they are generally, in, in general terms. Again, individuals matter, but in, in general, statistically, much more willing to accept risk. The one other component that I did want to throw out was the other element of, of opposition to publication uh, came from the perspective of, and like I was told this by like one of my spies, you know, within the you know, senior offices, um, you know, this individual said, hey, uh, this doesn't fit the narrative of the Army's return to what was called or what is called as decisive action, which is nation state versus nation state warfare. Um, it doesn't meet the narrative that we're trying to sell to the Hill or as part of public affairs. And consequently, we don't, or they don't want to see it published because it muddles our narrative. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I, I, that was my follow up. It's going to be the same thing again. So now it's just, we, we write this book, we throw it away because it's like, oh, I guess if I fight China and Russia now, I'm like, the, yes. it's kind of disturbing to hear the military. Of the army would want to say, well, we get to make a narrative because to me it's like an anthem. You know, it's, you I mean, to make a narrative. The, the army is a bureaucracy just like any other bureaucracy. Yep. And you know, again, some of the bureaucracy there's elements of culture involved, but some of the elements of bureaucracy also leadership matters. Um, and so, you know, you there, there's a left and right limit, and how, you know, however you go within that is kind of dependent upon who's in charge. Um, but yeah. Okay. Uh, so can you, a couple of questions around this issue yeah. of doctrine and narrative. Mm -hmm. First of all, can you just unpack this idea of why it doesn't fit into the narrative? Because from what you're, what you presented <laughs> today, it sounds like the army would want to say, this is the last thing you want to do. Yeah. Right? Uh, so that's so I, wrote, I wrote talking points for the chief to try to basically incorporate that as a way to sell it. You know, like, hey, this is a component of like nation state versus nation state warfare. That even, you know, nation state versus nation state warfare isn't as clean as we like to think it is, right? 
We, you know, we occupied Germany, we occupied Japan, we occupied North Korea and set up a provisional government in Pyongyang for the couple months when we controlled North Korea, okay, back in the Korean War. Um, and so you would think that like, you know, cooler heads would prevail, that it'd be like, okay, yeah, this is a component of that. Um, sometimes people just, I don't know, I don't think, you know, they don't think logically, they get so fixated on it. Sometimes things will get personal too. Um, and then, uh, I guess, so, so a lot of it is, is the, the, you're aiming for the narrative and, I'm sorry, go so, ahead. So the, the broader question I have yeah. into which this fits is the, is the sort of the celebrity status of FM324 yeah. and things like that. Right. But also how that selection of a population-centric coin mm -hmm. strategy around 0607, to what extent does that shape and limit the options in Washington? Right? Because there's an argument that this mm -hmm. was a strategy of capitalism. John Gentile says, Right, yeah, yeah, so that's a Gentile yeah. fight at the operational level limits what DC can do, what the White House can decide. Yeah. And it limits your strategic options. Yeah. Basically, to persist with this or pull back, which is what happened. Right. So, could you reflect a little on to what extent this, the narrative and the celebrity status of population centric coin became the succession for a couple of years, spilled over into Afghanistan, and now is just completely. Pitched. Yeah, so I think the default setting for the army um, is nation state versus nation state warfare. Um, I think that is the default setting. I think that is what, you know, we are, I'm going to use we very loosely, the former army um, are most comfortable with. It's not messy or it's perceived to be not messy. Um, and then also, frankly, it's like, it's the ones we win. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, it's almost, it's even reflected in like the uniforms that the army has chosen, right? The previous blue uniform was the Civil War, nation state, effective nation state, big war, armies, corps, big battles, theoretically not messy, reality, very messy. Um, and then again, the uniform the ar army has chosen now is the World War II uniform. Th those are the default settings. And, you know, this is, it's almost like, we lost in Vietnam. Uh, we now lost again trying coin here. It almost is like this self-fulfilling prophecy of, oh, we're just not good at this stuff. Um, and almost like, you know, the second date is proved like had a bad date first, second bad date, okay, we're done. We're not meeting this person anymore. Um, and so I think it's like, it's become also self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I don't know if that, that helps. Okay. How well do you think, uh, especially with your effort, but just in general, that the lessons the Iraq conflict are being taught in the Army professional military education? So from West Point up to the War College, like, yeah. because that's, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so West Point. Okay, so I'm a product of West Point, I and mean, I do, I love West Point, it's in my heart. Um, but uh, we used to teach two, uh, two, uh, semesters of military history, uh, 80 lessons total, okay? Um, out of those 80 lessons, something like 10 were on Napoleon, 15 were on World War II, and there were like two or three on Vietnam. Okay, now they teach one semester, and so it's even further compressed, where I think they've crushed, you know, Vietnam and Korea together. Um, you know, it is, it's just what we, I mean, you know, we were in the military, in the army, we were, you know, our national training center, you know, the CTC in, in California, Port Berlin. They were fighting, you know, Soviet motorized divisions, the Krasnodians, like up until 2006, you know, like tank on tank warfare. And they didn't really start to integrate, you know, in large level, like civilians so in battlefield, guerrillas and sergeants until like 06, you know, like three years into the war. Um, so, so in some ways, it, it's depressing. It's like, you know, it makes you want to like take up, you know, medieval history or something <laughs> like light like that. Um, but, 
On the other end, other end of the spectrum, that there is, I think there is some hope in that there are many like leaders who are lieutenant colonels, colonels, majors, um, who you know fought these conflicts. And in some cases, you know, saw like when things did go well and have kind of like taken that to heart. And when they become in positions of ultimate power, I do have some optimism that some of them might change the media. You know, there are there are bands of partisan rebels, you know, fighting the empire. Um, that I, I think that give me some hope. Uh, not much, but some. And I'm gonna make this the last question. Okay. So going forward, how does the U.S. improve its building partner capacity since we're going to have to use it again in the future? Yeah, so great question. And that's a, it's a, it's a huge topic. Um, so to have effective building partner capacity, you have to have people who enjoy doing it, um, who have been specially selected and assessed to do it, um, who have language skills and regional expertise, um, and who are not like a pickup team who are thrown together at the last minute to like, hey, you know, okay, you, 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 and you. You are now the team who's gonna build the Iraqi military. And oh yeah, you're our main effort. That was like literally how it was in Iraq. And in some cases, like the selection criteria wasn't like, you speak Arabic, you've worked in the Middle East. It was, and in the army, you know, the right shoulder patch is where we, uh, right shoulder is where we wear our combat patch, like to show that we've deployed. Like they'd be like, you don't have a right shoulder patch. You are now on the team going to Iraq because you haven't done your shift. That was like the selection criteria for the building partner capacity teams in like 05. Um, so I think, you know, like to sum it up, like a key element of it is you have to get serious about it. You have to create doctrine about it. You have to create capability where you have standing organizations that do it. And you know, the challenge is that the, the question is, and, and there's, there's a whole issue also within like the soft and general purpose community on this topic, in that in some ways the soft community, we really blew it very badly and that we got very enamored by this like kill capture and everyone, everyone wants to be like JSOC, you know, like so we're all gonna, you know, you know, our, vet bro, you know, fears and, you know, guns and, you know, we're going to, you know, go bang some doors. Uh, and, and I mean, a lot of that, I mean, a lot of this, my community fell for it, really did. And that took away from our community's support for doing that because we're doing some of that stuff. Um, and in some ways it's intoxicating, right? It's like, because it does provide those theoretical short-term rewards. Like, you know, you've gotten a, a jackpot. You, know, you you know killed or captured something. You accomplished theoretically accomplished something, um, and so it, on the soft side, the soft has its own internal issues to kind of work through. On like okay, well, wait, where do we need to focus? Right, like what what were we created for? What were we should focus on? Um, and that that's a component of that issue. On the other end of the spectrum, when you're doing large you know, reconstruction, like the, you know, the scale of Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, even if you deployed all of the soft forces for perpetuity and committed them just to the building partner capacity mission, there still wouldn't be enough units doctrinally to train all the forces you need to train. So the conventional forces have to have a component of that game if you're gonna do this large scale building partner capacity. So I guess in general terms, you know, the three areas I would, I would say is soft has to sort out what their role is going to be and they should refocus on it. Second, um, the conventional horses have to get serious about doing it and doing it right. Um, and I don't know, I guess those are the, 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 the components. Uh, we've hit our witching hour, so apologies to those of you who still have questions. Uh, but before we all go, please join me in thanking Colonel Sobchak for our fantastic. <laughs>